before that, we have Professor Helen Mayberg, who is the Professor of Psychiatry, Neurology and Radiology at Emory University, who's going to speak to us about iterative strategies to refine and optimise deep brain stimulation for depression. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm going to switch it up a little bit because as a neurologist using imaging to study a psychiatric disorder, I want to emphasize what you heard so much about yesterday with neurotechnology and this morning and what, what my colleagues talked about really with the psychological realm that we all think about with mental illness and actually see how there's an intersection directly with intervention of the two. I'm going to be talking about uh, interdisciplinary team to actually make these kinds of points, which I think is a big theme of the conference, which is that these kinds of experiments require everything from really well-trained and empathetic psychiatrists to very skilled neurosurgeons, engineers, and um, signal processors. But what I want to talk about to get you into the mood, so to speak, is what would be the motivation to target a mental illness, mainly severe major depression, with a brain device and not real-time MRI, not with a magnet, but with an implanted electrode in a particular brain circuit. And I want to help you to realize that depression, as we heard from Professor Hyman, can have quite a broad range. But in fact, depression is a combination of disturbed mood plus mood, it's, it's a mood disorder plus cognitive, autonomic, circadian, and motor problems. And as William Styron described his depression, I'll call your attention to the second paragraph, nearly immobilized in a trance of supreme discomfort. This isn't having a bad day in its, in its extreme form, but it is a mental anguish from which you cannot escape. And so, you know, the good news is that for major depression, not only can we treat many patients with cognitive behavioral therapy, with medication, with TMS, with um, electroconvulsive sh therapy in extreme cases, but we don't always get the patient the treatment that is best, and that's a whole other talk about precision psychiatry to match patients to the treatment that they need. But what I want to talk about is for those patients who may have done well in previous episodes, who actually have a malignant transformation of their illness to where now no treatment is effective, and they are basically in a depressive purgatory to which there is no relief. And so as we think about that group of patients where there's a high degree of suicidal thought and completed suicides is how we might take advantage of tools developed for other neurological disorders, namely deep brain stimulation with implanted electrodes. And that has really been possible for work such as ours or in obsessive compulsive disorder or in Tourette's or in many other illnesses under investigation because of advances in neurosurgery and imaging, but particularly the experience in Parkinson's disease. And um, Professor Benabid is, him, is here, and I'm happy to be able to see him and, and acknowledge his fantastic work. So basically, this is the implantation of a small wire with contact points that one can deliver very focal stimulation through the skin, through a small computer, and give instructions to stimulate in an area of the brain all the time. These are implanted under stereotactic guidance with MRI. These have been done hundreds of thousands of times all over the world for Parkinson's disease. And what you have to know to think about how might you do that in another group of patients, and in this situation, depression, it's the 20 years of work to define, as was done in Parkinson's disease, understanding the motor circuits, the basal ganglia, the um, direct and indirect pathways through the basal ganglia, but to actually build comparable circuit models for psychiatric disorders. And we've heard pieces of them for PTSD, for schizophrenia, and the same is true for depression. With the idea that if one can target or knows what the elements of that circuit is, that one can actually modulate that circuit of choice um, directly. So we need to know where would be the critical node in a circuit should you have it, what would you like to have happen, what particular symptom, because there's many symptoms, and who might be appropriate candidates. I 
want you to think again back to those early descriptions of the patients with depression to realize in many ways it isn't the cognitive impairment, it isn't the, um, well, the difficulty with social interaction is profound, but it's actually not just not experiencing pleasure, but what actually makes patients wish to be dead is the inescapable mental anguish, this gnawing agony. And the idea that it isn't just pain, it's pain that actually makes you blame yourself. So Todd have got a twisted circuit. Rats don't have it, worms don't have it. And the issue is, is where might that be as a place in a circuit that is stuck? And what our approach was now more than 10 years ago was to define through a series of imaging experiments those areas of the brain that seem to be most important for the negative experience. And there was a particular area in the brain, um, area 25 for short, is deep. It can't be accessed by a magnet or um, one can try to access it by thought. But that area is maximally activated even in healthy people when they feel sad. And that region consistently downregulates across all treatments. And if it doesn't downregulate, you don't get well, whether it is regulated with cognitive therapy, with drug, with ECT, with CMS. It seems to be an important pathway for this element. So what we literally did was actually target that area based on the original imaging findings, implant two of these DBS electrodes, turn it on to block the activity as had been done in Parkinson's disease. And in six patients, this is now more than 10 years ago, um, we had four out of the six of them do quite well. And these were people who had failed all available treatments, including ECT, and had been in their current episode more than four years. What was important were two things. Four out of the patients got better, two did not. That gives us an opportunity to try to understand who might be an appropriate candidate, but for subjects, the main reason you start with six is to make sure that it's safe and you don't hurt anyone. It's not done to know if it really works. But actually, the finding in the PET scans was that, in fact, these people had overactive 25 that shut down their cortex, and when we stimulated over time, that pattern reversed. And we repeated this in a larger group of subjects, first with my colleague, um, the surgeon Andres Lozano in um, Toronto. Um, and again, about 60% of the patients showed this pattern of recovery um, that has sustained, as the panel on the upper right showed, out to six years, that with continued stimulation, we repeated the experiments in Atlanta and could show that similar group of patients percentage got better with a similar technique, different psychiatrists, different environment, different surgeon, and that we've continued to see long-term sustained results in patients implanted in this way. Other centers around the world, both um, in Europe and in the States, have targeted different putative nodes in this quote-unquote depression circuit with varying kinds of success. And the issue that we have to act is, it, is, act, is it the same circuit? Is it a different node in the same circuit? Is it the same circuit? You can target the negative mood as we were interested in blocking. You can push positive. You may actually alter the state of the brain in different ways, and that brings up the idea that different patients may be best for different procedures in the same way that different patients, based on their brain maps, may be more appropriate for cognitive therapy or drug. So what we wanted to try to do was to understand who a, could we understand why the patients we thought that should have done well didn't do well? So understand non-response, not be afraid of non-response, but to take the data we have and work backwards, reconstruct, deconstruct the circuit, and figure out had we picked inappropriate patients or the easy approach is maybe we just hadn't targeted as precisely in the non-responders as the responders. And what we learned is that the surgeons were extremely good at putting it in the same place anatomically. But it turns out that the PET scans were helping us to realize that actually Area 25 downregulated its activity across everyone, and the difference was whether or not you got into the rest of the circuit. And so what we started to do was to map with 
MRI scanning, which you saw earlier today? What's the wiring diagram of the brain? Can we look at the white matter that connects Area 25 to its co-conspirators and understand what might be different between stimulating in one contact and its nearby neighbor, one having an effect and the other not? And what we found through an engineering exercise with signal processors, imaging specialists, um, engineering modelers was that one could model how much, how much the current being used impacted the white matter in this putative circuit. And what we found was that all the patients who did great shared the same remote connections in the brain. We could get the wiring diagram that all of them shared when they recovered. And it wasn't that non-responders that we totally missed but they were missing some vital and important connections. And quite frankly, in seeing um, Professor Meyer Lindenberg's presentation, those areas for social connectedness in the frontal lobe are absolutely vital that you hit. And area 25 connects to those areas. And if you miss those connections, you don't get well. And we could prove it by actually seeing patients that by trial and error recovered over the course of a couple of years by randomly trying different contacts, that when those patients got well by a change in where we were stimulating, we could see that when we reached those frontal lobe regions by this trial and error process, those patients recovered. So the way to then test whether or not that logic is correct is to do another set of patients and literally, instead of implanting targeting area 25 and that region alone, is to actually make a map of the white matter in real time in each patient in the operating room. So that literally on the scan, as you've seen in all of the magnificent presentations prior with these kinds of scanning technologies, is one can drive in an individual subject until one sees and hits that spot that hits this blueprint, this intersection of these four contacts. So this isn't a group average, this is driving in each subject to find that place where the entire map will be hit. And the surgeon did a great job. We replicated our map. And actually, this is the curve of our latest group of subjects who actually never had the contact changed as we usually did. And eight of the 11 were um, better at six months. We went back to the map to see if there was an alternative. No alternative in one an alternative in another who was changed and she recovered, and one that just took a little longer. So suddenly, we've explained the variance not having to deal with the right patient, not having to deal with the metric that we're using in psychiatry, literally by refining the map itself. This has helped us to start to look at maybe this skeleton, this, this set of regions isolated by the white matter map, targeted by the DBS, basically taking this invasive intervention, working backwards and saying what part of the depression map is really the core. And we start to look at the integrity of those pathways directly across different groups of depressed patients. And it turns out that the ventral medial frontal, one of the pathways, all the depressed patients, whether they need DBS, they need therapy, or they need drug, everyone has an abnormality in that pathway. And that's on the left. In contrast, the connections subcortically to the thalamus are seen in people who need drug and who need DBS, and those that respond to therapy have an intact system there, both the white matter and the functional connectivity on the fMRI scans that you've seen. But there's a pathway through the cingulum bundle to the supplementary motor area, to the willed action where your interoceptive awareness lives, the very thing where a patient can't escape their own mental turmoil. They're in pain and they can't move. This is the area that gives you willed action. And in fact, that area is uniquely abnormal in the depressed patients. So what we're starting to see is that now that we know the system, we're actually seeing that the recovery curve, when you stimulate and stimulate long-term, there are two parts that it isn't a linear change where you just get better and you're eventually better over time. But in the operating room, when you stimulate, there is this switch phenomena where a patient can describe a lifting, a, a um, openness, a connectedness that actually happens only when you're stimulating in this confluence. And then there's a change that happens over weeks to months where it's actually hard work. 
And it looks as though the Area 25 change happens rapidly, probably in the OR, whereas the changes in the cortex require more time. So we've started to actually dissect the phenomenology, what the patients say, listening to them, what is the experience of switching, and actually looking at the white matter map that goes with the particular kind of experience. And in fact, when the state of the body, when the release, when the break comes off, you've hit the cingulum bundle. Whereas when you have the bigger sense of connectedness to someone else, you've gotten into the medial frontal connections. And this has allowed us, now that we've defined the circuit, understand some of the phenomenological features that the patient experienced, we can start to get in to the hard part, but the important mechanistic part of how does the brain change. And we can make measurements of electrophysiology, we can do scanning, we can do GPS and follow their behavior, and do that both in the operating room, but with next generation devices that allow us to measure the brain in real time all the time. I just want to finish by going back to the patient and going back to Emily's um, beautiful introduction, that what we have to recognize with our technologies and in the setting of both very ill patients and less ill patients, that recovery, no matter what the process, is more than just the treatment. And in this case, recovery is more than a stimulator. Patients actually learn after that reset that they actually have to do all the heavy lifting. And the expectation was is that the device would take care of it. And I think that as we think about how we might take best advantage of the technologies discussed yesterday, discussed this morning, as we understand the workings of the brain in exquisite detail, as machines can tell us how we're thinking before we know ourselves, that we have to have interdisciplinary teams, whether it's in science or it's in the clinic, that help us refine the metrics to develop proper clinical trial design but most important, rehabilitation strategies. Once you get the brain to a state that actually it can retrain, that's when the hard part starts. And if we don't do that and take advantage of this emerging um, plethora and renaissance of biology, then um, we'll be nowhere. And I'll stop there. <laughs>